Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. Jesus said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbour. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. So may Almighty God have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing that you have made and forgive the sins of all those who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of you the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. And the collect for the second Sunday of Lent. O God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word, Jesus Christ, your Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. A reading from Genesis. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you 
and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but you shall be called Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. The word of the Lord. A reading from Mark. Jesus began to teach his disciples that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? For those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Word of the Lord. Who are your heroes? Who do you really look up to? and want to emulate. My seven-year-old son is very clear. It's Spider-Man and Black Panther. Those are definitely the top of his heroes list. And I tend to appreciate the unlikely and flawed heroes that we read about in fiction. Fictional characters like Frodo Baggins or Harry Potter. In real life, though, I think it's a little harder to find heroes. People we hold in high esteem are so often pretty flawed, and it's hard to get past it. As a young girl, I idealized missionaries. They seemed like such heroes to me, going off to foreign countries to serve God. And then I went to serve and lived with a missionary family overseas for a year and realized... Well, they were just like everybody else with problems and character flaws of their own. I also used to idolize pastors and priests, but that went away pretty quickly after I got to seminary. The truth is, we're all just people. There is just no one person who will never fail us or disappoint us in some way. So who can we look up to? Who can we emulate in this life? Who can inspire us by their witness? Who are the true heroes? 
I think we need to be inspired and encouraged to do what and to be who God called us to be. So then the question becomes, what does that look like? What does that look like in God's kingdom? Jesus is, of course, a hero in many ways. And Jesus is a hero whose witness never fails. But the example and the calling of Jesus is not always an easy one to follow. In fact, even Jesus' disciples struggled with this because as Jesus began to tell his disciples that he was going to suffer and be crucified and killed, we see in our reading today that Peter was absolutely scandalized by it. That did not fit his definition of success, of heroism that he had in mind for Jesus. That is certainly not the way of power or empire. It is not the way of the world. And so Peter goes and actually rebukes Jesus, rejecting completely this path. Peter, like most of us, wants to form his hero into his own image and by his own definition of heroism and success. And he uses the world standards to rate that. And it certainly doesn't include laying down one's life in this sacrificial way. But we see in the reading that when Peter does that, Jesus responds with those famous strong words. And he says, get behind me, Satan. You see, the way of the world, the way of empire and its standards of success and heroism, which frankly usually includes violence, is totally opposed to God's way. Being a hero in God's kingdom looks very different. And Jesus makes it clear that this path, this call of God on those who would follow him, involves denying oneself, taking up one's cross, and following him. Those that want to save their lives will lose them, he says. And those who lose their lives for his sake, they will save them. And then Jesus asks us this incredibly powerful question that I'd, I'd like us to think about today. The question is this. What will it profit you to gain the whole world and yet forfeit your life? In Matthew's version in the gospel, it's translated soul here. What would it profit you to gain everything the world offers when it will result in the loss of your deepest soul, your deepest self, your very life? You see, the world promises us much. The way of the world is a seeking after power and success, which is inevitably gained by dominating others. It turns out that it usually is a success that is gained through oppression. In fact, many of the traditional heroes in our culture are heroes that defeat others through this kind of superiority or show of strength, dominance, oppression. And it is idolizing after such heroes, such forms of success that leads to the broken systems that we have in place, systems of white supremacy, the oppression of other people groups for the benefit of those who have the power and the privilege. In fact, this past week, you might have seen the news story that the San Diego Union Tribune ran. It was an article exposing the fact that in San Diego, the rate of suspicion um, of suspension of black students, young black students from the ages of kindergarten through third grade, very young, was more than double that of white students. The disparity in these rates actually just increases with age, according to the article in the study. Meanwhile, we see the news being filled with stories of hate crimes against Asian Americans during the pandemic. In fact, one of our own parishioners' relatives, someone who was born here in the U.S., was recently verbally accosted while she was on a walk and told to go back to her own country to stop spreading the virus right here in San Diego. The way of the world, this sense of superiority, this sense of domination that leads ultimately to violence, to hatred, it is exactly what Jesus is rebuking when he sees that creeping up in Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. 
Mohandas Gandhi studied the Gospels. He understood this teaching of Jesus, this path of nonviolence, very well. If you've ever seen the movie Gandhi, you know that in the opening, he tries to explain this approach to victory through nonviolence. And he says this, I am asking you to fight, to fight against their anger, not to provoke it. We will not strike a blow, but we will receive them. And through our pain, we will make them see their injustice. And it will hurt as all fighting hurts. But we cannot lose. We cannot. They may torture my body, break my bones, even kill me. Then they have my dead body, not my obedience. In contrast, the way of the world invokes the call to fight and take up power and domination and arms against others to achieve one's ends. The world says, take up your sword. And Jesus says, take up your cross. Success and victory are not gained through this kind of violence and power. The battle, the battle is won through the power of sacrificial love. It is the path of humility and servanthood, not pride and domination. So I sometimes wonder, do those who claim to be followers of Jesus actually understand the call Jesus has, the call he has for his followers? Do I understand it? Because my own knee-jerk reaction is a lot like Peter's. Jesus' words make me feel uncomfortable, and I too want to prove myself and my worth, especially when I've been wronged. The impulse is to fight, but not with humility and love. And so I, I think we have to step back and ask, what is our goal? Who are we trying to be? Who is it we are emulating? And what is the ultimate goal of our lives? If the goal is short-term success by the world's standards, to gain the world and all it offers, then there are actually plenty of quote-unquote heroes to show us that way. But it is so short-sighted. If the goal instead is the divine plan for our lives, the road less traveled, the way of Jesus then we must be willing to forfeit the gains of this world in order to save ourselves and our very souls into eternity. Because what does it profit me? What does it profit you to gain the whole world but forfeit our souls? The answer, of course, is nothing. C.S. Lewis summarized this concept this way. He wrote, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. This path of sacrifice, of self-denial and love is a path of heroism that has been trod by others, but they are fewer and farther between. Most of them haven't been featured in films or by the media or really anywhere else. But they are there. They are featured as saints of God. They are known to God. And they may be known to some of us as well. They have left this world a better place than the way they found it. And so this Lent, we are invited to once again lay down our swords and our definitions and visions of success according to this world and become heroes of faith. Heroes that take up our cross and follow Jesus, and in doing so, gain so much more than this world could ever offer us. Amen.
the prayers of the people. Let us join together in a time of prayer, knowing we are one in the risen Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray for the church, our leaders, and its ministry. For our bishop, Susan Snook, Father Mark Hargraves, and Mother Rebecca DeNova, and for our administrator, Walter DeMille. We pay, pray for the nation and those in authority, for the president, vice president, the members of Congress, our state and local leaders. We pray for the world and, and for an end to tyranny, hunger, and homelessness. We pray for our local community that we may all learn to love each other and reach out where there is need. We pray for those who are sick and or suffering, for those ill with coronavirus, and for those who are caring for them, for the staffs and volunteers who are administering the vaccines, and for all those who are suffering due to this prolonged pandemic. We pray for all those who have died from natural causes, the coronavirus, or hunger, or tyranny. We give thanks for the warmth of the sun, the sparkle of the moon and stars, the consistency of the oceans, and for the love of our friends and family. Grant, O oh God, that your holy and life-giving spirit may so move every human heart that barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatred cease, that our divisions being healed, we may live in justice and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please add your own prayers, silently or aloud. And in the words of that Jesus Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, Father who, who art, art in, in heaven, heaven, hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So may Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining with us today. It's been great to have you with us. If you're, uh, you're joining us for the first time, do uh, send something to us via the email or a prayer request. We're always pleased to hear from you. And there's three things I'd just like to draw out by way of announcements. Firstly, that at 11 o'clock on this Sunday morning, we're going to have the second of our Lent series, looking at uh, the Lenten practices. And today we're going to be thinking about uh, repentance or penitence. 
So that's at 11 on Zoom. Then our, um, for the season of Lent, the church is going to be open from 10 till 12 in the morning, uh, from Monday to Thursday. I'm grateful for the, to the volunteers who are staffing that. Uh, so that's, uh, please know that you're always welcome to come in and pray in the church. And of course, many of us haven't been inside the church for many months. Well, now this season of Lent is your chance. And then finally, the request I'd like to amplify from St. Mark's Food Pantry. And uh, I'm delighted that we support them. And uh, they're particularly asking for uh, canned vegetables. So those could be left at the parish office and they'll make their way uh, to St. Mark's. Thank you. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Thank you.